Hello and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us to celebrate uh, Martha Berglund's The Birdman of Koshkanong, The Life of Naturalist Dori Kumlein. Um, thanks, of course, to Martha and uh, to Chuck Stebbleton for being here in conversation. Um, I'm Mike Went. I'm the program director here at Woodland Patterns. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we, that in Milwaukee, we live and work on traditional Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee homelands along the southwest shores of Michigami, part of North America's largest system of freshwater lakes, where the Milwaukee, Menominee, and Kinnikinick rivers meet, and the people of Wisconsin's sovereign Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican nations remain present. We further acknowledge the grave evil colonialism introduced to these lands through genocide as well as slavery, but also via racist and xenophobic beliefs, laws, and practices that continue to inflict harm upon black, brown, and indigenous lives. We honor those who have lived and do live now at these intersections of identity and experience are committed to the active dismantling of white supremacy. Um, thanks again for being here at Woodland Pattern. Um, to those tuning in um, as well on Crowdcast, thank you for joining us that way. Um, we're so grateful to be able to um, present this program along with the Wisconsin Historical Society Press and Milwaukee Audubon Society. So many thanks to everybody as a, who's part of those organizations who helped make this happen. Um, very grateful. Uh, this is the first Woodland Pattern program that we've hosted here in this room since March 2020. Um, so incredibly excited to be back here with you. Um, and grateful to be here hosting events in this room for as long as conditions allow, hopefully quite a long time. Um, but moreover, I want to say that it's wonderful to be back in this room, in particular for this first event with Chuck and Martha, who have such an intimate relationship with Woodland Pattern, and it's a beautiful way to kick, kick things off again for this, for this return. So thank you both for being here. Um, and thanks to all of you and to all of you at Crowdcast, in Crowdcast for sharing this space and your space, and um, just so grateful. Um, we have copies of Birdman of Koshkanong for sale at the front if you're here with us, or if you're uh, tuning in on Crowdcast at woodlandpatternbookcenter.com, or come visit us. Um, we are open Tuesday through Sunday, 12 to 7. Um, and then finally, just a note to say that there will be time for questions from the audience. Um, both you, those of you in the room, as well as those of you tuning in on Crowdcast. Um, so sort of Chuck will cue us when the time comes. And uh, if you're on Crowdcast, you can chat your questions. Um, and you can really do that at any point throughout, right? So then what will happen is I will read questions. I'll have a microphone in the back so that everyone can hear the question. And then we'll receive an answer that way. Those of you in the room, of course, can just raise your hands and ask your question, right? Um, <laughs> the old-fashioned way. Um, so just to let you know, to think about any questions you might have. Um, and I think that about does it for the, for the, the business end of things. So I just want to um, welcome Martha and Chuck. Martha Berglund is co-author with Paul Hayes of Studying Wisconsin, a society press biography on famed Wisconsin naturalist Increase Lapham, in addition to Birdman of Koshkanong. Um, and that book, Studying Wisconsin, won the Milwaukee County Historical Society's Gambrinus Prize. She has written two novels, A Farm Under a Lake and Idle Curiosity, both published by Gray Wolf Press and taught for many years at Milwaukee Area Technical College. Chuck Stevelton is the author of An Apostle Island from Oxide Press and two previous full-length collections of poetry, as a birder in Wisconsin, a master naturalist volunteer, he has offered interpretive hikes for conservancy groups and arts organizations, including Friends of Cedarburg Bog, Milwaukee Audubon Society, Woodland Pattern, Friends of Lorraine Niedecker, and the Linden Sculpture Garden. Martha and Chuck, it's an incredible pleasure to welcome you both. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I, I want to start by thanking, too, um, this is, it doesn't seem that, that I can really launch a book without being here in this room. And um, I know that's true, not just for me, but for other people. This is where, this is where it starts. Even though the book came out earlier, this is where it seems that it's beginning. So I'm really grateful to Woodland Pattern, to Anne and Carl for starting all of this. And, um, and for, uh, to, Jenny Grapp and uh, um, Laura Solomon for carrying on. 
Also, I'm grateful to the Milwaukee Audubon Society because they um, sent a grant to uh, the Wisconsin Historical Society, which paid for the wonderful color illustrations. The, I, I love the way the book looks, and it's in large part due to the Milwaukee Audubon Society. And Kate Thompson there, and uh, Chris Caldwell at the, at the uh, Historical Society, um, and Elizabeth Wyckoff, who was my wonderful editor there. And I would like to thank Lena Peterson Angseth, who was a poet and tr researcher and translator that I couldn't, have she, I couldn't have written the book without her because I don't read Swedish. She, she is a Swede. She knew her way around the libraries and the research uh, engines in Sweden, and it was just amazing what she was able to do for me. I also want to thank and, and think of my sister, Brita Berglund, a poet. And it was Brita who I would call up and I'd say, I can't do this book. But I'm, you know, this is crazy. I can't do this. And Brita would always say, yeah, you can. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. And, um, and I also want to remember the last time she read in this room. Um, she's listening tonight from Washington, D.C., and I feel like I'm talking to people out in radio land, you know. But anyway, she, um, she read here, and it was a beautiful reading, except somehow I allowed my cell phone to go off twice during the reading. And, um, and so I've got it coming, Greta. I don't know, she's maybe got something going to go off in this room, but, but I'm thinking of her. And I also want to thank my husband, Jim. This book was start, I started it five, six years ago now, and uh, it would not have been written without all the help and support in, from Jim Uranek sitting right over there. So these, these things don't happen by, with just solitary people in a room. It takes a dang village. Anyway, thank you. There are more people in this room I see to thank, too. Okay, Chuck, let's get started. Okay, and let's start with the Lorraine Niedeker connection. Okay, actually that starts in this room. It was May 12th, 2015, I was here in this room, Jim was here too, and it was Lorene Niedecker's 112th birthday celebration. There was cake, it was good cake, as I remember. And I remember listening, and I, Lorene Niedecker is one of my very favorite poets, is my favorite poet, she is the poet, well anyway, she's pretty wonderful. And I was listening to, I remember listening to Carl and Tom Montag talking about the poem Turi Kumlein. And I realized that I'd never really paid attention to that poem, and I didn't know who this, that person was. And at that time, um, Paul Hayes and I had completed the Lapham book, and, uh, and I was in search of, well, not necessarily, well, an early 19th century naturalist, Wisconsin preferably. So I was looking for somebody. I, I wanted to do another biography. And I really had, I didn't know what I was going to do. But I thought, well, I'll go home and look up this guy, Kumlein. I didn't know how to say it, and I'm not sure that I do now. But I looked up, <clears throat> I went home and I looked up Kumlein, spent the couch, spent, spent the weekend Googling on the couch and um, realized by the end of the weekend that I might have found my guy. And I remember asking Jim, can you, can you know this kind of thing in a weekend? And I mean, it seemed awfully fast, but um, I was pretty sure I was right, and, uh, and I was right. Um, and I discovered him through Laureen Niedecker and through the the discussion between you and Montag in this room in 2015. 
So, and then I, and I continued to explore Lorene Niedecker and her, um, her writings about her exploration of Turi Kumlein too. And that, there were wonderful stories there. She, she, by the time I'd finished reading Lorene Niedecker, her early versions of the poem, which is right up here, and, and you should read that. It, uh, I, I knew that this was, this was my guy. So why don't you read the Niedecker poem, Chuck? The excerpt here on the left is actually just the first stanza, and there are two poems in her for Paul sequence um, for Kumlein, and it, the first of them is titled Turi Kumlein, and the second um, is not titled, but it's indexed by its first line, Shut Up in Woods, which I believe she took from a, a Kumlein letter. That's in the mm -hmm. book. Yeah. Um, Turi Kumlein. Bigwigs wrote from Boston, Turi, we must know about the Sand Hill Crane. Is it ever white with you? And how many eggs can you obtain? For Turi, the solitary tattler opened a door to learned birds with their latest books who walked New England's shore. One day, by the old turnpike still crossing the marsh, down in the ditch, he found a new aster. To it, he gave his name as though he were rich. Shut up in woods, he made knives and forks, fumbled English gently. Now March is gone and I have much undone. It would be good to hear the birds along this shore intently without song of gun. And of course, all of this is taken directly from her reading of of uh, Kumlein's manuscripts in the Wisconsin Historical Society archives in Madison. And um, they're just wonderful little, um, oh, little tidbits that just draw, well, drew me in to this man's life. She talked about, uh, in, in, in a letter, she talked about grandchildren of Kumlein's playing horse with mounted pink flamingos <laughs> and, and a botanist at war with, who, who could, had to keep marching and he couldn't collect plants. And there were just so many little, little um, ends of stories that drew me in that, that, and she was right. He was somebody to really, I think, to spend time on. So, but it started right here. Thank you, Carl. And it sounds like you had an increased Lapham-shaped hole in your heart at yes. that point. That <laughs> yes, I did. And I tried to get Paul Hayes to come to work with me on this on this book, but he said, no, he had another book to write, and he's he's done it. So hmm. anyway. Which brings to mind Niedeker's other great naturalist poem. Asa Gray wrote, Increase Lapham, pay particular attention to my pets, the my grasses. My pets, the grasses, yes. Yeah, oh yeah. Yep, we've used that in a, a piece. So how did Kumlein seem to you at the beginning and then at the end of your research? Well, that's, that's an interesting question and I'd never been asked that. And when I started thinking about it, I realized that, that even though I was intrigued, when I get, there was a certain point at which I thought, oh, I don't know. Is this going to be okay? Is is there enough here? And am I going to am I going to am I going to like this man? I have to. I don't know how people write biographies of really icky people, mm -hmm. because you have to spend so much time with them. And I knew I had to not just like him. I had to love him. And when I saw this photograph, the one that is on the screen now, I thought. Well, okay. I um, mean, this is a photograph of an old man. Actually, that's probably a couple of weeks or even a month or two before his death. And but it, you know, it's not a real glamour shot, <laughs> as you can see. And and I, it seemed kind of a, a bit grim. And I was hoping that there was more to it. And and then when I began to see, when I began to research. The, the early life 
and began to realize what this man did to, um, in his, when he was 23 years old, the risks he took, the, what he, what he, le he left Sweden at the age of 23 with his sweetheart, Christine Wahlberg. Um, they didn't, he left an estate. He left his edu his um, university studies. He left um, his family. He was the eldest of 14 children. His parents had recently died. So in some senses, you would think he would have to, he would have to stay. But he decided that he had to leave, or he wanted to leave, or both. Um, most of the time, and then so that by the time I got into the the early life, I was I knew that this would be fine because he was he was a man who was um, beautifully educated. Um, he, he seemed to um, have fine well, if you can say this, fine feelings about things. He was not a jerk, and and um, and he had certainly was leaving leading an interesting life as a young man. So as a young man, I liked his adventurous spirit. I liked um, the risk he took to leave Sweden and come to North America. And as an, as, but then when, he, when, I, when he became an older man and when I got to know him better, um, it was, he took on more and more interesting aspects. He became much deeper to me, uh, a, much, uh, a man who, who had so many facets. He was, um, he was a poet, he was a musician, he was a collector of botan uh, botanical specimens, he was obviously a collector of bird specimens, he was um, um, a wonderful family man, and um, he, he was, a, a good letter writer. He was a bad farmer, but but he there were just so many aspects of his life. And when he did write, the few times he did write, he was a gorgeous writer. So that the deeper I got into his life, the more I appreciated. And I think it shows on his on his face. I don't know how much you can read into faces, but but I like the face. And he was a he was described by um, a young friend as a, as a sturdy man, so that he was not, he looks in some of his photographs a little bit frail, but he was not frail. I mean, you, you couldn't be frail and do the physical things that he did. And, um, uh, and he was, he could walk a long ways, he could c carry heavy loads, he could shoot well. He was a physical man as well. And, and uh, so, at the beginning of the research, Chuck, I, I had some, even though I knew that this was gonna be good, it was, um, it was gonna be a good uh, story and a good life. I had some trepidations, but, uh, but, I'm, but I stuck with it and, and he, he came through to me as, um, um, as a really interesting character, and I hope he does in the book too. I just really hope he does. Let's look at the landscapes of his youth and young adulthood. Okay. All right, so first of all, what we have here is, um, well, can you skip ahead a couple to, no, go back. Let's. Let's talk about where, where, um, like, no, back further. Yeah, let's go. So many people ask, well, let's talk about Lake Koshkanon mm -hmm. first, since that's what we got here. And um, here's a map that tells you where Lake Koshkanon is, Koshkanon is in relationship to Milwaukee and other parts of eastern Wisconsin. And also you can see the funny shaped lake. And Kumline settled actually just north 
of this uh, of Lake Kashkinon, about two miles away. But let's let's go on to uh, the landscape of his youth. Well, let's do, well let's do more Kashkinon first, and then there's a contrast to what he left. This is um, a drone image of of really Kunlein's country. This image was taken by a friend of ours, Manuel Quintera. And you see a farmstead in the foreground. Later in the 1870s, the Kunleins bought this front 40 that's on this road and built this house. But when he settled, he was living in, that, in um, the woods in the center of the of the uh, slide slide here, and um, and near right on the, right at the edge of that was was a series of Indian mounds and still is. There are twenty seven Indian mounds on the property, so he at, he 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 settled first closer to the lake, which you see in the background, which was a wild rice marsh in the early days, and there and there were marsh all around, cattail marsh, and uh, and Kashkanon Creek winds down there through through to the to the lake, but you can see the the really gorgeous lay of the land, and and the the plot of woods that he actually never cleared, and it hasn't been cleared, as far as we can tell. And we see that in the area there was some tamarack marsh, tamarack swamp, or not swamp, but tamarack marsh, and the tamarack trees are the greeny yellow ones in the front. And we can see that also in that area is next. This is Kashkanon Creek um, on the north side of Highway 106, uh, which was the old military road that went through Bussyville. And you can see the kind of marshy area. It must have been somewhat like that when in Kumlein's day. And in the next sl slide, you see uh, uh, the, the creek running through the woods. Um, and you can see that, that there are lots of different kinds of habitats in those days and in these days, too, in that, in that area. And in the next slide, <coughs> is um, what's called a flat woods, which is um, a woods that, that is flooded parts of the year. And the habitat for ducks and um, all kinds of birds and actually all kinds of, kinds of mammals must have been stunning in the early days in all of these habitats that you can see from the area. Now, why did he come to Kashkanon? Um, you haven't asked, but I'm going to answer. Uh -huh. that one. Um, <laughs> because he saw this prothonotary warbler habitat. Yeah, right. It would have been. Well, he know he knew when he got here. It was it was some great habitat. So, uh, what else do you see in the habitats here? Well, it's Check interesting to note with that drone view of the of the Kumline property, um, which looks pretty dry agricultural maybe mm -hmm. some some oak hickory um upland woods but to think that there were tamarack black spruce um that there was more marsh intact there even mm -hmm. wild rice at kashkanon yeah yeah um yeah prothonotary war war <laughs> okay so there are several um, stories about why he came to Lake Kashkanan. What, the family story that that I came upon early was that on the boat coming over in 1843 with Christina and Christina's sister Sophia um, and with some other interesting Swedes and Danes on the boat, they somebody brought out a map and showed Lake uh, showed Wisconsin, that showed the central probably Wisconsin. I don't know what the story was on the map, but the story is that he saw Lake Kashkanong and figured that that would be a great birding site because 
He knew what a great burning site looked like because he lived on one when he lived in Sweden. And maybe that's the next slide or so, yeah. So, so what he wanted, I think, is he, he wanted to be near a lake like Lake Hornborga, which was near his home in Skara, Sweden. And this is an old, early photograph. I love this photograph. And um, this is where he, he hunted as a boy. This is where he collected birds as a boy. And um, he didn't want to be really far from this, the kind of migratory um, flyway that he was on in Sweden. And he certainly he got to one of the great flyways um, in this country when he got got to if we traded those cranes out for sand hills and maybe a whooping crane that could be Horicon Marsh mm -hmm. or Nasida or Cedar Bird Bog. Mm -hmm. yeah. He would have recognized that landscape. I recall hearing that he looked at a map and saw where the flyways would mm -hmm. be, but that might be apocryphal. Well, I didn't find it, you know, it, it, I found it in the family stories, but I didn't find any, that doesn't mean it didn't happen, but I never found any uh, other proof. But he also was, was drawn to this area by Gustav Unonius, I'm certain. Gustav Unonius was a, an intellectual Swede at Uppsala University, where Kumlein was when, at the time he left. And he, he was a friend. And um, he left Sweden uh, two years before, was one of the first to leave Sweden uh, as an immigrant. Um, the, the Swedish immigrations didn't happen for many years. At, the big ones didn't happen until many years later. But um, so Unonius's letters back to Sweden, which were published in Aftonbladet, a newspaper, drew a lot of Swedes to North America because he settled at Pine Lake in 1841, not, not too far from here. Um, so that's one thing that got him here. Um, but I think it was drawing him, um, he might have been thinking he was going to go to Pine Lake, but I, he might have changed his mind on the boat. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know how that happened. But I do know that on the ship, the Svea, uh, was a, um, was a, what was he? He was a, he was a, um, a Swede. And he, was, he had gone to get his mother and bring her back to Lake Kashkanan, um, where he had lived. And so this guy, ben Benoworth, um, must have spoken in some detail about Lake Kashkanan and told him what was there. And, and actually, Kumlein and Christina did settle right near Benoworth. And I think that might have been the most important thing that got him to Lake Kashkanan, but we, we don't really know. It's kind of neat to think about. But. Of course, he didn't immigrate in isolation. He had stories that were connected. Yeah. yeah. So Uppsala University brings us to his upbringing and formal education. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Um, he had, in some ways, a kind of ideal upbringing. Um, he was probably one of, he went to some of the best schools in Europe. He went, um, he was, came from a wealthy family. The, the Kumlines um, had um, a wonderful estate, there it is, um, which is still there. It's still surrounded by oak trees. Um, An Eck garden means oak farm or oak garden. And he did think about it all the rest of his life and, um, and talk about it, but, um, but he left it. His, his parents had died, as I told you, uh, of one of cholera, one of cancer. And um, he was, even though he was the oldest of 14, he somehow, I mean, I never found out how it is that he so easily left behind 13 younger brothers and sisters, but he apparently had no problem with that, and I, I'm not sure why. But um, he went to 
the best school, one of the best schools around, which were, well, in Sweden, which was called Skara Cathedral School. And um, he got a classical education. He studied Greek and Latin, and he studied natural history. He also read books in English. He, um, he learned to paint and draw. His parents had made sure he had painting and drawing lessons early on, but and he, in all stages of his, of his boyhood, was encouraged to collect specimens and bring them home, which is not, so that he, it was fine with his parents that he would um, skin birds and put them in his, fill his room with these, um, these mounted specimens of birds and, and pressed plants and mammals that were skinned as well. So, hmm. and. And he learned to play the flute. I mean, and he, I mean, he was just, it was sort of dreamy, his, his childhood. Um, and he continued studying all through um, he, this, some, some of the same things when he went to Uppsala University. But he concentrated at that point, and this is one of the old school buildings not too long after he was there. This is the Carolina. But... Um, the book opens with an image of the Linnea Borealis, which was named for Linnaeus, mm -hmm. um, also um, at Uppsala University. What did he inherit from Linnaeus? Well, he inherited a teacher, <laughs> Elias Fries, who was one of the most famous, um, uh, well, he studied fungus and, and mushrooms. He was a botanist. But he had the Linnaeus chair at Uppsala University, and um, and he he was firmly in the in the line of Linnaeus, and um, and he some people and actually the family some of the family lore is that he would if Kumlein would have stayed, he would have taken the place that Elias Fries. Mm -hmm. Um, but he apparently didn't want, there was no indication that he wanted to be a university professor, which is kind of interesting, I thought. Um, and it's partly, I think, because he was really interested in um, field work. He didn't want to, I think he did not want to be a, a, a university. He saw the university and he was not that, interested in staying when and left here, early yeah when he got here he was quick to recognize the plants and the birds it would be mm -hmm. unfamiliar to most but it, he must have inherited that taxonomy that Linnaeus mm -hmm. invented to get here and to yeah. recognize what he was seeing so yeah. quickly yeah and when he got here he didn't have any American books of, of plants or birds so, but he used what he knew from Sweden, and he brought a, a number of books with him. I wish we still had them, but we don't. Um, so he had a wonderful education, he had a wonderful background, and he left all of that behind when he met a woman named Christina Wahlberg, who was a serving maid, that's what he, she was called in the family stories. And it was not possible for an upper class man and a a, a, um, a lower class woman in those days in Sweden to to have a real life together. You, they could marry, but it would have been a difficult life. And so the two of them very quickly decided that they would together go to North America, mm -hmm. which I think is pretty, I mean, it's kind of gutsy, but it would have been tougher perhaps to stay. Mm -hmm. Okay, where are we in these questions, Chuck? <laughs> Who were his close contemporaries, and who did he correspond with? Who did he collect for or trade with? This is one of his drawings that he brought with him uh, uh, hmm. of, of a bird. And now I can't remember what it is. But he brought a number of paintings, little paintings of birds with him that he'd done as a youth, and that was one. Um, you know, when you posed that question, who were his contemporaries, uh, my first thought was, okay, who in this country were uh, 
who were the ornithologists practicing at the time that he was. And of course, you think first of Audubon. And Audubon was still alive when he got here. Audubon didn't die till 1851, but by that time, Audubon had kind of moved on to um, collecting mammals. And, um, well, not entirely, but, but Audubon could not have been a, con a kind of contemporary in the sense that, in the, that Kuhn Lang never met him and, uh, um, and he could never afford any of the books. His whole life, he tried to buy some of Audubon's books, but they were just out beyond his reach. So Audubon, whom we all think of as one of the great ornithologists of the day, he, I don't think of him really as a kind of contemporary, even though he wanted some of his works and, and understood who he was, and he probably did before he left Sweden. He knew who Audubon was. I mean, I'm sure he did. Um, and Thomas Brewer became a contemporary when when they began to correspond in 1851 and corresponded for really the rest of Brewer's life, almost 30 years. So that, that in a sense, those, those two were contemporaries. Um, but, but really, I think that, that Kuhnlein's contemporaries were two men uh, that he left behind in Sweden. One was a man named uh, Magnus Cornell, whom he um, went on an expedition to Gotland Island with. I don't have any images of him. And the, another man was Carl Gustav Lohenheim, who, who played a large role in Kuhnlein's life in Sweden. They were friends at Up Uppsala University, so with um, Magnus Cornell and and Lowenheim, where uh, he met at the university. And, um, but I didn't know much about Lowenheim, but, except that Lowenheim paid his way to this country. He, pay, he bought the tickets for the three of them who came together. And so when I read that, I began to wonder, okay, who was this guy? And I backtracked, and, and then I found that he had some, um, that he was, a, he was interested in birds. And there was no study in the university of birds. They could, you could study botany, but there was no ornithology. I mean, the word ornithology wasn't even used at that time. So the... the and if they wanted to study birds, and there was a, two or three of them who did, these guys I'm talking about, they would go to Stockholm to look at museums, specimens, or they would go on expeditions together. But, um, and I know, because it was in several family documents that, that Kuhnlein took a, uh, went on an expedition to Gotland Island. And, and I saw, and there's one sentence that in the, in Kuhn Lein's papers that told about this, or that's all it said, was that he went to Gotland Island. And, and I, and it, he said he went with Mons Cornell, or Magnus Cornell. But that's all I knew for way too long mm -hmm. about this expedition to Gotland Island, which was important for, it was it was his major expedition, and but I couldn't just put in a book in the book that he you know it said he went to Gotland Island. Uh, I hadn't solved the problem of what I would do, how I would how I would fill this hole, which is a big hole, in this story, until the the researcher I told you about, Lena Peterson Engseth was corresponding with a woman named Maria Asp at, oh, what is, at one of the research institutions in, in Stockholm. I don't remember the name. And Maria found, was looking up a Lowenheim file. And she found, as she was going through this Carl Gustav Lowenheim file, she found a manuscript 
that had Kuhnlein's name on it. And this manuscript turned out to be Lowenheim's transcription of Kuhnlein's story of, or report of his trip to Gotland hmm. Island. And that hole was totally filled up by these amazing notes. They're, I never found, nor nobody has found the originals of cum lines, but, but what must have happened is that, is that Lowenheim, who had lots of money, paid for this, and we know that he paid for the Gotland Island trip, and then he also paid for the, the trip to, uh, the tickets to um, North America, and, and Kumlein, as soon as he got to this country, began to send birds back to, back to Lowenheim, and uh, gradually, over 16 years, paid off his tickets by sending birds primarily from Kashkinon. Which I, and, but that, but that discovery by Maria Asp and um, and um, uh, Lena is just it was one of the most wonderful moments in the in the research was was that. I might have had the image of Brewer's Blackbird in mind when I asked that question, but I think it was more the big wigs from Boston writing to yeah. him in Niedeker's poem that I was wondering about. Yeah. I, I don't know that, I mean, Kumlein never met any of these bigwigs in Boston. He never even met Brewer, who became actually a good friend through correspondence. But um, he's, he, he did correspond with John Casson, at, at, uh, who, was a, who was the great taxonomist in Philadelphia. He corresponded with Spencer Fullerton Baird at um, the Smithsonian. And, and a, a number of the bigwigs. Who that, birds are named for. Who birds Cass are named for. Yeah, yeah, all those. <laughs> and, but interestingly, a bird was never named for Turi Kumlein, though one was named for his, his son, Ludwig. Cool. So. <laughs> Where's Gotland Island? Gotland Island is um, um, off of South... It's an island off of Sweden, and it's um, east and south, off the southeast coast of Sweden. It's a pretty big island, about the size of Long Island. And he spent, he and Mons spent maybe, well, a whole summer there. And, and uh, I love the story of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of their summer. It was a dreamy summer for two boys that, they were boys in those days. Hmm. Um, and they got to do, shoot a lot of birds. <laughs> <laughs> and they also went to the little Carlso and big Carlso, tiny bird. I mean, they're, now there's two of the most famous bird islands on the, in Europe where, the, where all the seabirds nest. And he spent time there too. But hmm. it, um, Anyway, I love that part of the story. Mm -hmm. I love finding it, for one thing. <laughs> this would be a good time to recount the missed encounter with increased Lapa. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as you know, Paul Hayes and I wrote a biography of increased Lapa, and, and w he was he's Wisconsin's first and perhaps greatest scientist, a really interesting ca character and man and um, who studied all kinds of, you know, every, ma every manner of thing. Um, and he was alive and in Wisconsin at the same time as Kumlein. Um, Kumlein died in 1888 and uh, Lapham died in 1875. Um, they were roughly the same age. I just, as soon as I began to work on the Kuhnlein book, I thought, oh man, I've got, to, I was looking for a point where the two men met. And it was just a kind of indulgence, I guess. But, you know, you'd, I, wouldn't you want to find a place where the two guys met? And um, I found a point at which 
they almost met. <laughs> and I have it written down here somewhere. Place. Um, and it was it was the fourth of July, eighteen. Um, what? I think it was eighteen fifty one. Um, yeah, it was 1851. It was the 4th of July, 1851. Increase Lapham was going around the state looking at reported Indian mounds in preparation for the writing of his great work, The Antiquities of Wisconsin, as surveyed and described. But, and it was, it's still one of the greatest Wisconsin works. So he was working on that. He was driving around the state with his nephew, John, and his horse, Billy, and their cart. And they got to Cambridge, Wisconsin, which is two miles from where Kumlein lived. And, and the horse threw a shoe. And so they had to have Billy get re Billy to the repair shop. And um, they stayed a couple of days in uh, Cambridge. And when I was first reading this, you know, I mean, it's just fantasy, but still, you want, you want them to walk down the road and, and uh, meet each other. But instead, they stayed in Cambridge. Um, they ate some good pork and saw some fireworks, and then they moved on. And he didn't, and Lapham did not hear about or look at the 27 Indian mounds which were on the property that by that time um, Kum Line owned. So it was, it was one or two days, it was a couple of miles, and they didn't meet. They might have met in 1875, just before uh, Lapham died, but we don't know. I mean, it's this would have been at a meeting of the Wisconsin Academy of Sciences, Arts, and Letters in Madison during that summer. And, um, but there's no record that Kumlein. Line, we, we know that, that part of the time that Lapham was there, but there's no record that Kumlein Line was there. He was a member and became a member that year, but I mean, I can't prove it, but they might have met then, but there's no record of it. So it was a near miss. They would have recognized each other. They would have. It would have changed. I think they would have changed each other's lives. I mean, for one thing, I I think uh, Lapham wouldn't have had to rely so hard on old Philo Hoy, who, <laughs> which I mean, I, I actually um, Brewer and Kumlein used to make fun of Philo Hoy, who was a who was collected birds from Racine and uh, collected other things. <laughs> collected other things as well, but um, Brewer and, and Kumlein didn't think he was a very good birder, didn't like his, his IDs of birds at all, hmm. so. What do we know, what do you know about how Kumlein regarded himself and what um, kind of thinker he was and what he might have sounded like? Well, I'm going to refer to one paragraph here, or two paragraphs, that are, I think if you look at this letter that he wrote to Carl Dorflinger in 1885, Dorflinger was his boss. Uh, he was the curator of the, uh, the director of the Milwaukee Public Museum um, and had been since 1881. And, would be for the, another year when his health got in the way. Dorflinger had been in the Civil War and lost a leg and had a lot of problems, uh, a lot of physical problems. But he was a wonderful naturalist and a wonderful museum man. He was the, essentially the founder of the Milwaukee Public Museum, where Kumlein spent the last years of his life. Um, very quickly, Dorflinger and Kumlein um, found uh, that they had a relation, they, they had a good relationship. Dorflinger came from that 
uh, all that German tradition of scientists and and he and Kumlein, who were essentially around the same age and came from the same kind of upbringing, the same kind of educational background in any case, um, immediately got along with each other. And Kumlein um, um, was very solicitous of him, as we can see in the beginning of this letter. Now, at this point in the letter, um, in, in Kumlein's life, he was working, um, he was living part-time in Kashkanang and part-time in Milwaukee in a boarding house. So he's in, at the time of this letter, he's in Kashkanang and he's writing back to Dorflinger in Milwaukee. And he says to Dorflinger, you must be careful in this weather. Um, he was worried about his health but he, Kumlein reports that, in, that he had just gotten home on Wednesday, footing it from Edgerton. I mean, this is a guy whose language, whose upbringing is pretty formal and classical, but he's perfectly capable of using English slang. By this time, he's pretty good at English, very good at English, and his writing is wonderful. Um, the next day he wrote, I cleaned up the gun and, wa and cut wads, I tried the gun, and three good skins was the fruit of the first of the three first shots. Not that I don't miss sometimes, but I find that I have not at all together, all not at, not altogether forgotten how to handle a gun. So I mean, we see a little bit of Kumlein's pride in his. I mean, we see a lot of his pride in his abilities here, and and also a kind of easy, relaxed language. A, a, a kind of almost slangy English. But then, but then he goes on in the next slide to talk about the whippoorwill. The whippoorwill, however, has come. I don't know what makes me like that bird so much if it is not because it was a favorite with my wife. Of course, sui, I don't know how to say this, quique, mos est, to each his own, with birds as well as folks, but we used to think that it was something peculiarly lovely in the confiding manner in which the whippoorwill, noiseless as a dead leaf, used to drop down on our piazza or by the door within a few feet of us and give us all the music she had, and that at a time of the day when the rest of nature was silent excepting perhaps some frogs croaking down below in the marsh. Now that is a 69 word sentence by a man whose language, first language is not English, and it's got all kinds of very sophisticated business going on. First of all, it's got an, underst uh, an understood subject and verb in the, I'm going all English major on you here. <laughs> But it's got an understood subject and verb in the first clause of that wonderful sentence, um, which is not easy to use. It's got that Latin quotation. You know, how many f settlers um, from Kashkanang are going to use Latin quotations or are going to refer to their piazzas? You know? Um, but the control that he has of his thinking in this knockdown, I mean, this just sentence just knocks me out. Um, the, the beautiful metaphors, the, he talks about the whippoorwill's confiding manner in which she drops down. And there's just so much here um, in his observations of the natural world um, it's ju it's just so rich, and that's and that's one of the things that I love about Kumlein is that his you ask about his mind. It was a rich mind, capable of uh, amazing thinking in in a lot of different realms. So it was not a one track mind. It was not, he was not just a scientist, though he could he could write a hell of a pa uh, paper, and he did to Brewer about why this bird is this, is, has this ID and not this one. 
very straight down the line scientific argument, um, but he could also be an amazing poet and was. Um, he sometimes wrote poetry. Um, he sometimes wrote little paragraphs that nothing ever really happened to them, but they were saved. And there must have been more of them. But there's some beautiful uh, sort of prose poems in his work. Um, and, and he's, I don't know, what do you see there that you like? Well, I think it's remarkable that there's a piazza on that marsh. Yeah. <laughs> um, I hear a little bit of his granddaughter, um, Angie Kumline, Maine, and oh, the way that she talks about um, her uh -huh. favorite bird companions, as uh -huh. she calls them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think back also just to the fact that the way he took his specimens was with a gun or a mm -hmm. pitchfork or whatever was at hand. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but then he calls the whippoorwill she. Yeah. That's very moving. I know. I like that too. Yeah. <laughs> And by that time, his wife had been dead um, for almost 20 years, and, but he still missed her a lot and, and referred to her. Yeah. So he was a complex man with, I mean, and his, his upbringing, his, his, his wonderful education, his, um, I mean, it could have been lost on, and has been lost on a lot of people, that kind of thing. But it was not lost on Kumlein. He was an amazing, he had an amazing voice. And it's too bad that he only wrote two major, and they're not even, I mean, he wrote two essays that he was sort of badgered into writing um, that are just wonderful. Um, and I wished to heck he'd written more. But he, he had a kind of a hesitance um, and a, an unsureness. He was not a man who put himself out, who put himself forward. He had no desire to be, you know, a great man, a famous man. He, he was not, he did not long to be well known. And, and as a matter of fact, did a lot of things to make sure he wasn't <laughs> well known. So, so. Um, Sure. Do you think that his manner with the language has to do with the fact that he might have still been thinking in Swedish and that he's he's actively translating as he goes along? I think by this time he'd, he'd been, I think he was thinking in English. I think he could think in Swedish too. And he's continued to speak Swedish because he had, because he had neighbors who were Swedish. Um, his children did not speak Swedish, but I, I don't know, I'm just guessing, but I think he could think in English as well as Swedish by this time. But I mean, the relationship, when, when you're bilingual that way, I think the relationship to either language has been altered. And it shows mm -hmm. up in the way that's constructed. I, I haven't looked at that to see how Swedish that construction is. I, I don't mm -hmm. even know that I could answer that question, so. Mm -hmm. but. I'm just curious. Yeah, I am too. Now that you raise it, mm -hmm. I hadn't thought of it. Was that area around Kashmir and uh, art being studied by Swedes? Or did you just happen to go over there? He's asking, was it largely settled by Swedes? If you go to the yeah. further north and west, in the Triplets area, there's a lot of Norwegian. Right, and I'm actually, trying to see if there's a similarity with Swedes. there weren't a lot of Swedes in that area. Um, there were um, there were some, there were actually more Norwegians in the Kashkanon Prairie than there were Swedes, so that just west of where he lived, and actually that was in Dane County, there were many Norwegians and big Norwegian farms. And he had a lot of friends who were Norwegian, and he was, uh, and he could, he, he would speak with them. Um, and he, um, there was, there were also a few French people, uh, German, so, it, you know, there were a lot of people people around, but not a huge number of Swedes, but there was a tight little Swedish group, that, the people who came over on the Svea together with Kumlein, though they didn't leave Sweden together as a group, they formed a group on the boat. Those people stuck together pretty closely for, for a long time. They lived close together and, and they were good friends. Paul? Did he maintain any ties at all with his family in Sweden after leaving there? 
He did. Um, there were there were apparently letters back and forth, not frequent as far as I can tell, and and I've never found any. And, and actually, one of the things that I wanted to do was was to get this one descendant of one of his brothers to open this trunk that he said there were a lot of old letters in, and. And we never got this guy. I mean, we tried, Lena and I tried, and we got somebody else in the family to try, and we never got this guy to open the trunk. So I don't know. You know, I'm sure there are things to be found. And, they, and, um, and there were letters that went back and forth, but, uh, but I, never, I never saw any of them, actually. Whether he um, was thinking in English or Swedish at this point, it sounds like somebody who's recited poetry, read poetry, written poetry, yes. maybe. Um, and, um, you know, I think of um, one of the more famous naturalists of his day, um, Humboldt, and his close friendship with Goethe. This is not something that we're used to. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> No, and when he was in Uppsala, he and all his all his friends were a, a, a really a mixed bag of people who were poets and musicians and scientists, and but they all were interested in the same um, the same songs, the same romantic literature. So there was a kind of a very romantic Swedish um, culture that these university men, and they were men in those days. Um, um, they really they really enjoyed and carried it with them to this country, sang the songs all their lives, and you know, recited this, the poems all their lives. So he wasn't just a scientist who read science. He, you paint a picture of him as a poet, musician, um, romantic, so how is it that we come to think of him as the Birdman of Kashkanong, as an ornithologist? And, right, and not, not of many other things. Well, I think it's, I had to really think about this, and I think it's partly my fault. But <laughs> because I couldn't think of a title for the book besides, you know, the Birdman and Botanist and Plant Guy of Kashkanong. <laughs> I don't know, it wasn't gonna work. but. That's part of it, but it's not a big part. I think we can, I think it's partly because of who his descendants were, who his main descendants were. His son Ludwig became, was beautifully trained by, by the father and became a very um, prominent ornithologist and taught at Milton, uh, Milton College and wrote the, with Ned Hollister, the first birds of Wisconsin. 1903. 1903. And it was um, based largely, well, not I don't know how much you could say, but maybe a third of the material came from his father's notes. Mm -hmm. By then, his father was dead. He died in 1888. But so that Ludwig became kind of well known, and the birds of Wisconsin became well known among scientists, and and Kumlein's name was carried on by by Ludwig. Ludwig unfortunately died very early, but still there was the birds of Wisconsin um, with both Kumlein's names on and in them, and then there was the granddaughter Angela, Angie Angie Kumlein Main, who wrote another book called um, Bird Companions. You can hold yours up now. <laughs> um, well, it has a lot of doggerel in it. Oh, okay. But yeah, I mean, it does have doggerel in it, but, but she also refers to her grandfather um, quite a bit, and she primarily refers to him as a, as a bird man um, in Bird Companions. So that the Kumlein main name gets carried on by these two bird people, and I think that's a large part of why that is. And the other thing is, this is not as flashy, you know? <laughs> June I mean, grass. June grass, I mean, really, the image of June grass is not, 
not as flashy as some, uh, some um, uh, mounted bird uh, on display in, in a museum. Hmm. Um, so I think it's partly that just generally um, uh, botany is not as, is not as flashy in some ways as, mm -hmm. as ornithology. Though he was, he was well known and well respected, not well known, I don't know how well known he was, but, but he, he had a protege, a young man named um, Green, I'm just I'm blanking on his first name right at the moment, but Green was a boy in Kumline's neighborhood and was trained by, by Kumline to be a, a stunning botanist and became one of the most famous botanists in the country for a time and named a, an aster after him. I'm as not though a, he were rich. Yeah, as though he were rich, says Lorene. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and do you have a sense of whether Kumline and his drive to be um, shared an interest in the science of birds or whatever, or was it more hormones? I mean, that's a big decision to make. And yeah. Part of it seems to me the reason that he left was the kind of life that they wanted they wouldn't have. So that makes it easier to understand why they might leave 14 or 13 other kids, mm -hmm. um, because they really had something important. But he mentions, you know, the whippoorwill being her, one of her favorite birds, and I was wondering if she shared some of those interests, or if you had any sense of that. My sense is, and there's very little evidence, because the, one of the strangest things of, about all of this material that I was researching is how little Christina is mentioned. Okay. Even though everywhere she's mentioned, she's mentioned as, as a wonderful wife, a wonderful mother, and she was beloved by Kumon. I mean, he was devastated when she died. And I mean, there was no doubt that theirs was a very fine marriage. But I'm also almost certain that they had very little in common. I mean, they had something in common, but it was not science. It was not an intellectual uh, relationship. Probably. Say that again? Certainly not an education. No, she did not have an education. She could read and write, but as far as we know, that's, that's about it. Um, but, but she... Um, she was an amazing, she was completely necessary to his life as, as, a, as a settler because she knew how to do stuff mm -hmm. <laughs> on a farm. You know, she had, she had grown up with uh, working in fields, tending animals, making cheese, doing all the things. You know, she was, she was a helpmeet. She was amazing to him. And, um, um, uh, no, it was a, it was a good marriage, but it was not a it was not a partnership in a modern sense. Yeah. Um, other questions? Anybody has questions at this point? Martha, did, did was his main income from the farm, or was it from collecting specimens? Well. One of the th things that I, this, this was true with the Lapham book too. We didn't find any financial records, any, there are almost no records of Kumlein's income and all of that. But it was iffy in both regards, so that the farm income was most of the time low and the income from collecting was not great. But together, it sort of, he cobbled it together. When th so they may, you know, they didn't starve. But um, their, f their, their life really improved in the 1870s when they began to grow tobacco in that part of the world. The tobacco crop was a big deal and a big cash crop in that part of the world, and still is to a little, some extent. And if you, had the, if you had the manual labor, and it was labor intensive, and if you had a lot of kids, that helped, then you could make money and, um, and, 
and pay off mortgages and do things like build the frame house that they built in the um, in the late 1860s. You said, you said his parents were wealthy, he came from a wealthy family. Yeah, I don't know. As far as I know, he got nothing. And but that too is another mystery that I've not been able to solve. It's in that trunk. I know <laughs> it's in that trunk someplace. But um, he's in Stockholm. I'll give you his address if you want. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know. He was not very. I, no, I haven't sent him a book. Um, but. Um, Maybe that's a good idea. I'll send him a book. Yeah. I'll send it collect. Do you know how much it costs to send a book to Sweden? But anyway, what was your question, John? It was about, oh, the family money. Uh, no clue. I don't know. There's just nothing I was able to find out about the money. People are really quiet about their money. We found that out in the Lapham book, too. Did find the estate. Yeah. At the end. Yeah. After we go to the public. Yeah. We found the disposition of that estate. Right. And it, it, this, this is beside the point, but the farm that he bought in Waukesha County is the most expensive piece of property in the county now. Yeah. It has a $21 million house on it. Yeah. Oh, nice. On the South Shore, we'll talk about that. Yeah. Hmm. Isn't that funny? So, uh, I mean, I just read today the story of, uh, between the, the brothers, the uh, Latham son, the one brother being the farmer and the other one being the, the ornithologist scientist. Mm -hmm. And the scientist one wanting yeah. money to do something uh, which would have been taken away from the brother that was right. the farm. So, you know, I felt that. Yeah, uh, Ludwig and Theodore, um, the Ludwig, was, all Le Ludwig wanted to do, he was the oldest son, was work as a scientist. He had no, as far as I can tell, no other interests. He wanted a job at, at, the, at a museum or, and he did get a wonderful gig on an Arctic tour that um, sponsored by the Smithsonian. But that, I mean, he never got a, a great job like that after that until he got a, it was hired at Milton College. But he only was a scientist. He only was a bird guy. Whereas Theodore, who was the second son, he wanted to farm. He never wanted to go to school. He didn't want to, he didn't have, want to have anything to do with these dang birds. And he just wanted to, um, uh, to farm, and he was a very good farmer. And he saved their asses, he really did. Because he got that farm sort of on its feet, and and he was a boy, he wasn't even 20 years old, and he was building tobacco sheds and, and, um, um, and sort of freed up all these rock stars to go out and do their, you know, to do their um, unpaid gigs. And, um, um, and uh, it was kind of wonderful what Theodore did for that, for that family. But Ludwig wanted to spend, what was it? Something was sold, a piece of land was sold. And Ludwig wanted um, to take that money and he wanted, he and his, he wanted to go to Sweden with his father. He wanted to spend the whole pack, pack of money on that trip. And Theodore said, no, we have to put it into the farm, you know, it has, and the father defended Theodore. He said, that's not fair. That's not a good way to spend the money. So um, one of the things that comes up over and over again is what a strong family unit, I hate that word unit, what a strong family they were. And, um, and Theodore was, a, I mean, Ludwig, Turi was a wonderful father to those, those kids. Um, but he had many heartaches because he lost, the year he died, he lost his, maybe his most beloved son, the, the baby of the family, Fritoff, who was, who was an artist. And, and one of, this is one of the things I love about Kumlein, 
is that Fritoff graduated from UW-Madison with a degree in pharmacy. Um, but he came home from college and he said to his dad, who didn't have much money, he said, Dad, I don't want to be a pharmacist. I want to be an artist. Now, how many fathers would say, wait a minute, you know, we spent all this money on you and you can get it. And, and uh, Turi said, fine, we'll send you to art school and I'll buy you, and he bought him paints, and he bought him paper, and he, you know, he just, he said, you have to study, you have to spend, you have to take time away from everything. And he, he had a wonderful set of instructions about how to be an artist, how, and how to give your life over to this, this work. And, you know, not many farmers, not many people would have, given Fritoff that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that wonderful freedom. Unfortunately, Fritoff died of, unexpectedly of a heart condition, but, um, but it, it revealed, and it just devastated Kum Line at Turi. It was just not long after that he died, but, but uh, it's very revealing of who he was when we see how he, how he related to his, particularly his sons, um, um, there's, he was a good father to his daughter Svea too, but she too died early, um, not too long after he did. Hmm. So, any other questions? Where are we here? Um, Where are we with time? We, we strayed from the script, but that's we good. We did. That's, yeah, good. that's good. I wonder if that trip that Ludwig made um, to the Arctic is where we get the Iceland gull named. Oh, yeah. Kumling. I'm sure it is. And they show up here sometimes in the winter. Yeah. yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. I'd like to see a Kumlein's gull. <laughs> it yeah. looks like every other gull. Yeah, I know. I can't tell <laughs> one dang gull from another dang gull. Looks like. <laughs> what uh, will we know if we know about the life of Thuri Kumlein? Well, one of the things we will know is what it might have been like to be a settler in southern Wisconsin in the 1840s and 50s. And, and through his life, I mean, I never knew very, I didn't know very much about how hard that life would be or the details of it. You know, you get a general feeling for it, but, but in studying what he wrote and his work journal, I mean, it, it was a devastatingly difficult life, especially if you weren't, you know, if you didn't have the, the muscles for it. I mean, and I don't mean muscles, I mean just the, the background for it. There were others who, who just single-handedly, single-mindedly became farmers and it was much easier for them, but, but it was a really hard life. But it was also a life that if you had people around you, and most settlers did, they, you know, they didn't move off to the woods and live all by themselves in a little house in the woods, which some writers have made very popular that idea. But, but there was, they really had a community, and they survived because, because they were, they were very attentive to each other, and they were good friends, and they had a lot of fun together on them. On Saturday nights, they'd get together and drink and play their flutes and sing the old Swedish songs. And, and you know, I, I mean, it wasn't an impossible life, but it was a tough life. So one thing, that's one thing. And this barn, and this was, this was when the barn looked pretty good. Um, so, the, I mean, it was a, t a very tough life. So that's one of the things we would know is is and that was in some ways the hardest part to write was the section on on the the early settlers life because i wanted to put it all in and my editor said nobody's going to sit still for two chapters of this so <laughs> and she was right but but um you know it was just so new to me and it was so uh, it was so detailed, and I knew so much about it because I read him that I didn't want it. I didn't want it to go away. I wanted to give him his due, but 
I saved you guys a bit. Actually, Elizabeth Wyckoff saved you from two chapters on that. So what's the next slide? Okay, and I've already talked about this. One of the things we will know about Kung Lein, if you read this book, is that he was an amazing family man. And here is Christina and Ludwig the oldest and Turi with pink cheeks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is Theodore the farmer. And here is Svea, the daughter. Little Fritoff would have been a, an, uh, an infant who wouldn't sit still. And Fre uh, Svea, named after the ship, uh, partly, is holding a little dove, probably something that Turi killed. But anyway, um, or his brother, yeah. But he was a wonderful family man, and, I, and that's, that was a big surprise to me, that this, would, this book this story would be a story about a family, uh, particularly when it, he just walks away from family at the beginning of the story. So um, that's one of the things I think we'll know. What's, what's the next? Hmm. We'll also know that they, these people had a lot of fun. Um, this is one of Ludwig's drawings of the bugs he's found. And if you'll notice in the upper left-hand corner, you see, <laughs> and you'll see that they were also a musical family, and there are letters. There are letters where um, they write to say, "Oh, bring your guitar home for the weekend because we we want to play," or "Bring the violin or the, and the flute because they all played instruments and they sang hmm. and they and the family the music was important in the family. I think that's a hardanger. It's, it's, it's got, a hardanger. It's got the two sets of strings. Oh yeah, <laughs> I never. <laughs> Interesting. I don't know that kind of stuff. That's beyond me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so one of the, th I mean, th this, I just love this page. This came from one of the family members. I'd not seen it at the archives. Uh, hmm. One of the generous fam family members who opened the trunk. Hmm. But anyway, um, and I, I like this little, I mean, he was not just interested in birds or plants. He knew a lot about the bugs, the insects. And this one is in Sweden. This little bug is at the Swedish Museum of Natural History. I just, and it's a water strider, water beetle. And here, I just, I don't know, I, it's one of my favorite photographs. I don't know why this poor dead bug, been dead for 150 years, but still, it's just, it's a wonderful. It's got cum line and anyway. So he was, I mean, he was really interested in, in all of the world around him, though he did concentrate on plants and birds. Hmm. What else do we have here? Well, this is a list I made at some point. And it's, we've already sort of covered this. He collected for museums all over um, in Europe and the Eastern US. He recorded, um, in, in lists, there, which were very important, in letters, and only two essays. Uh, I wish he'd written more essays. Mm -hmm. but um, And he was also the first curator of the Milwaukee Public Museum from 1883 to 1888 to his death. And um, he, did, he was working on, with his, with his son Ludwig, at the end, the two of them were working on a display that would be the birds of Wisconsin. And I think that in some ways that was the first birds of Wisconsin, was the, was the, um, was the, the mounted birds that the two of them had gathered and were putting together in, in a museum display. Hmm. Um, I wasn't able to find out what, you know, what happened to the whole display. Some of the Specimens are still there, not all. In um, the cabinets. In the cabinets, mm -hmm. yeah. There are those specimens at the Horde Museum in right. Port Atkinson. Right. So if you want to go look at some of Kuhn Line specimens, your best bet is to go to Fort Atkinson, go to the Horde Museum, go up the stairs to the second floor, and look at the room that has lots of, lots of birds in glass cases. And I think two or three of the cases are Kuhn Lines birds. Um, Say a word or two about how his pre preparation of the birds may have contributed to his death. 
Yeah. Of course, you had to preserve bird skins. Um, and the, pres- the best method was, was powdered arsenic. And um, so all of these, these bird guys were inhaling. And this had been the case for more than 100 years. So that these bird guys were inhaling arsenic, and um, it's very it's it's very likely that 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 Kuma, I mean, you saw the picture of him when he was an old man. He'd been sick for a long time with too much arsenic and 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 other chemicals too. Sometimes he would unpack boxes at the Milwaukee Public Museum and that came from South America, from other parts of the world. They didn't know what that stuff was preserved in. And, and the story is that he opened a box um, in, I think it was August 4th, 1888. Um, on a Sunday afternoon, he was at work and he opened a box of um, birds from South America. And it, they were, it was some preservative that was not known to him. He, uh, either inhaled it or touched it, was immediately very ill, taken to um, a hospital and died that afternoon. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when he was, what was he, 78 or something like mm-hmm. that? Yeah. Um, but yeah, the arsenic, and, and one of those, one of those um, famous um, um, bird guys, the the, had recently died. Recently died. Not long before, Kumai died of arsenic poisoning too. I don't think it was Cassin, though it might have been Cassin. Mm. Anyway, did they, did they know about the toxicity, or were they? Oh, I think they did. They just used it. Yeah, but you know, they they thought, oh, I, I'll be careful, you know, mm-hmm. but. But the other thing is that there wasn't at that time a good substitute. Uh, and, and one of the thing, reasons that ornithology began to, to became, become a, a, a real science is that they were able to preserve bird skins. And this was you know, 150 years before Kumlein died. But, but they were able to preserve bird skins and therefore compare bird specimens. So, I mean, it's very hard to compare rotting birds or birds on the wing. So it, you had to have preserved specimens or you didn't have a science. You, didn't, you couldn't look at them. So they're willing to put up with the arsenic for the science, but we don't have to. I, I'm not sure what they use now, but mm. it ain't arsenic. Um, Let's see the Smithsonian trays. Oh, yeah. Now, one of the things, one of the reasons that cumline is important is, is because these preserved specimens are used for all kinds of things. Now, the, none of these are probably cumlines. This is the Sm- Sm- Smithsonian uh, photograph, and these are birds preserved for their mainly for their plumage, so they're all pretty colorful. But these birds can be studied, these old bird skins can be studied in ways that Kumlein and his compatriot, or his, his um, the, what's the word for the guys who lived at the same time? Contemporaries. Oh, it's a hard word. Yeah, thank you. Anyway, his contemporaries, um, they, they had no idea. They, they were doing this purely for the taxonomy in order to know what, how birds differed from each other and what, you know. But now, all kinds of things are done with these bird, bird skins. They, they've got, they use DNA, they test them for, um, for um, pollution on the, on the feathers. You probably know more about this. And that taxonomy this. is somewhat fluid over time. They just lumped or split. They lumped the sedge wren and the grass wren. Um, okay. you know, and, and some of that is genetic testing. Mm-hmm. So they have these, um, there are drawers and drawers in the basement of the Milwaukee Public Museum. I'm curious mm-hmm. to see how those will end up with oh, a potential Oh, I, I can't even think about it. I'm scared. Um. <laughs> but I mean, what'll happen to all that stuff? You know? yeah. 
um, nests, eggs, yeah. everything from little hummingbird skins to flamingos down yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. But, but, um, but they can be used. I mean, he would be thrilled to know all the uses to which his bird skins could be known. The and next slide. What's the next slide? Okay. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> these. One of my favorite parts of the, the story is how he d distinguishes the Philadelphia vireo from the um, Gildas vireo. What's I don't know. Is that the warbling vireo? Yeah, maybe? the warbling vireo. And but these are two specimens that are in uh, the Swedish Museum of Natural History. They've they were wonderful. They have they they let us. They, they have all these, a lot of them, a lot of specimens are just in drawers, as you see. But a lot of Kublein specimens are either mounted by him, and I suspect they were not mounted by him. Mm -hmm. They were mounted when they got to Sweden. Um, but they have dozens and dozens of Kublein specimens, and they were so generous with their photographs. And they said, we'll put any, any we'll photograph them any way you want. And, they were just they were just thrilled that we were working on Kumline. And and we were thrilled that there was just all this stuff to see. But one of the one of my favorite sections of the book is about how he how he makes the distinction between these two warblers. It shows his beautiful scientific writing. Mm -hmm. You you have a question. No, I'm just it's nice to see the Vireos up there. Okay. All right. All right. What's the next slide? Oh, the oh, black tern. Oh, yeah. The black tern he saw on Gotland Island, shot a bunch of them, <laughs> and, and he was very happy to see it at Kashkanag, and he wrote about it, and it's, it's a wonderful bird. They fly their courses up the Rock River and even the crawfish out there. So. There are not too many of them. Uh -huh. They're still around. Okay, and then the next one is, ah. yeah, <laughs> that's... Xanthocephalus, Xanthocephalus. Right, <laughs> the yellow-headed blackbird, which is not common and, and seen sometimes up at Horicon and down at, in Around, this part of the... Around um, Rose Lake near Koshkina. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, one of the few accounts we have of him searching for birds that he, uh, one of the few accounts he wrote is of his search for the yellow-headed blackbird. I don't think we're going to have time to read it because we must be. What time is it? I mean, how much, how are we doing here? We should see if there are questions from the crowd cast. But that is okay. one of my favorite chapters in the book is the, oh, the, like, yellow, the Brewer's Blackbird, Yellow-Headed Blackbird in the bird, in bird books of North America. Yeah, I like all that stuff too. <laughs> I love the Yellow-Headed Blackbird stuff, yeah. Um, yeah, we do have another, this is for you all, but also for those listening to my now disembodied voice coming in um, from off the screen. If you do have questions at home, feel free to put those in the chat. Um, and if there are any more, as we begin to wrap up here, um, in the room as well. Any questions? Yes. Is it fair to say that um, his science underpinned his real passion being poetry and essays and music and other things that go beyond science? I can't imagine him not being all of those things. I mean, I don't think you can separate them out, really. But, you know, I'm looking at him 170 years later, whatever it is. I don't know what it is. But anyway, um, I, don't, I, I don't think they're separable, even in, certainly not in my mind, he was a poet, and he was a scientist, and and um, he was a musician. He was a he was a he was a really a pretty interesting and and good man. You know, I couldn't find anything 
crappy he did to pe anybody, you know? Like, I, and we were lucky with increased laugh on that way too. They were, they were good men and well-rounded men. And, uh, uh, and Wisconsin was pretty lucky to have these two guys, this, two of our earliest scientists, I believe. Yeah. Religious? Mm, that's a good question. He, he sometimes was. Um, <laughs> um, he, he joined the, the church that Unonius became a pastor of, an Episcopal church. Um, and I, but he, he um, and I think he, I think he was a Christian, though he didn't, there's not very much written that, that he wrote, but here and there are sentences where he, he um, asserts a, a, a very Christian belief in Christ and, um, especially during the, the Civil War when he writes to, to um, Green and uh, um, yeah, I, yeah, he was, he was, but I wouldn't call him a, re a real religious man, but I think he was a Christian. There's not a whole lot of evidence for what he believed, but especially during the Civil War, he wrote a couple of important letters about that, so. Well, there's a lot that we didn't touch on, including yeah. Albion Academy and Sterling North. Maybe we should close by mentioning some landscapes that we could visit now to see the world as he was. Yeah, yeah. You, you're, you're better at this. Than, go ahead. Well, and Jim we mentioned to... Rose Lake. Yeah. Dorothy Carnes Park near Fort Atkinson gives a real sense of the landscape mm -hmm. in its time. Nacida Wildlife National Refuge, Cedarburg Bog, maybe Oricon mm -hmm. Marsh. Horicon, yeah, definitely Horicon. Um, Jim, you want to add anything here? Jim knows, Jim and I um, toured. He stepped into the original Savannah of southeastern yeah. Wisconsin and southern Wisconsin, and he talked about how rapidly he saw the decline in plants. Mm -hmm. Just within a few years, he was mm -hmm. very, he was so in tune with the landscape, he really felt that change. And so we bring our hands today, but that was going on a long time ago. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. Well, Chuck and Martha, and everyone here, and everyone out there on Crowdcast, um, this has been absolutely wonderful. And thank you so very much. Thank all of you for, for coming, for being here and there. <laughs>